Now looking at plant leaves here, something we all might take for granted, we kind of assume, oh yeah, plants have leaves. Uh, but hopefully this uh, lecture will try to give you a little bit more of an appreciation for some of the complexities and differences within leaf structures of different plants. So starting with the basic, leaves are like living solar panels, and the goal is to collect the sun's energy. Just like our solar panels are all through the field here, so the, the leaves, their goal is to kind of collect and absorb as much of that sun energy as possible so that the plant can efficiently carry out the conversion of this light energy to sugars. So starting in general, leaves are usually the most predominant shoot organ and are structurally diverse. And we see just a couple examples here. Growth occurs by means of marginal meristems, and the marginal meristems grow outward and ultimately form the blade portion, which is the flattened portion of the leaf. And once the leaf is fully expanded, the marginal meristems cease to grow. So once they reach maturity, those leaves will no longer grow. Only in the early stages will leaves grow. And as leaves are growing, as an important note, while well, we think of leaves always producing energy, when a leaf is very small and it's first expanding, it may actually be a sink. It may actually consume more energy than it provides. At maturity, though, leaves will definitely produce more than they ever um, took initially. But sometimes they get going. That small leaf might be more of a sink than a source until it gets fully mature and reaches maximum efficiency. So looking at a cross-sectional leaf, so what is a leaf? I try to provide some nice examples here and try to relate kind of a cartoon image to what a real microscopic image may look like. So remember our cuticle located at the top here. We know this arrow will indicate right here at the top is where the cuticle is. The palisade parenchyma located this region right here. This is the upper portion of the leaf, and this is important for absorption of a lot of sunlight. Spongy parenchyma here. It's spongy because it needs to allow for gas exchange and for water exchange. And then if you look here, our stomata, right, allowing for the influx of CO2 and the release of oxygen protected by our guard cells. Well, that's located right in this region here is where the stomata would be. And our mesophyll, which is this entire area between the upper and lower epidermis, this red region right here, this would be the mesophyll section. So this is a very high quality image, and hopefully this kind of cartoon and well-defined image here can help you interrelate so when you look at the real image, you're able to recognize these certain regions on the leaf cross-section. So looking more in a macroscopic, something you might be a little bit more familiar with are the leaf parts. The node is where it attaches to the stems. The node would be down, down this region. The petiole here is the leaf stalk. The blade is, contains the network of veins and vascular bundles. And the margin is the very edge here of the leaf. And the midrib in this case is very strong in this, and the tip would be the very end. The reason why I typically point out the margin is that it's important potentially for identification purposes. And we may do a lab where you're kind of investigating different leaf structures, and the margin is one thing you can use for identification. So dicot and monocot leaves do differ. So I have some examples here. A is a monocot, and this has leaves with parallel venation, meaning all the veins are run parallel to one another. In contrast, we have pinnate venation, and this is where a leaf as a main midrib distinguishes it as a dicot. So here's this strong midrib here, and then we have the network that branches off from there. Same thing here. This is the real-world example. We have that strong midrib, and we have a branching from there. Ginkgo biloba is a plant that has what we call palmate venation. kind of like spreads. Think of like the palm of your hand kind of spreading out, and that's indicated by these leaves here. Remember, a ginkgo is a gymnosperm. Uh, in the same classification of conifers such as pine trees. Uh, this is just one example of palmate venation. This is pinnate venation, and this is parallel. Leaves can also be expressed in different types of um, simple or compound, and these are a variety of forms that exist. Simple leaves are a single undivided blade. So you hear this banana tree. Nice, simple leaves. Then we get into compound leaves. They have a blade divided into leaflets. So we could see here, uh, palmate leaf compound, then compound leaves, that leaf is divided, and they're divided in a palmate form. Then we have pinnate leaf, we have that strong midrib here. And then we have double compound leaves, example here, where, yes, this is kind of like a leaflet within a leaflet here. So these also can be helpful in use for identification of certain leaves for certain species of plants. To kind of give you just kind of a quick general cartoon image, if you will, Pinnately compound describe leaflets that are arranged in pairs along a central axis. 
there's Paul Maitley compound described leaflets that radiate out from a common point at the blade end of the petiole. See some examples here of pinnately pinnated, pinnately lobed, and pinnately compound. The compound has those distinctive little regions. Lobed, we see these definitely lobed regions. And same thing here for the palmately. Palmately, palmately lobed, we see some lobes developing, and palmately compound. So there's almost individual, what looks like individual leaves. Now how they're organized on the stem is another key factor, and something that you may not notice a lot, but when you start looking at it, it's, it can be interesting. So the goal is to maximize sunlight exposure. This is why leaves are arranged in different patterns. Alternate is when leaves spiral around a shoot. We see here alternate. We see one going here down, one going up, one going down, one up. They're alternating their pattern. Kind of like left, right, left, right, left, right is alternate. Opposite occurs in the opposite sides of the shoot. So here's our shoot, and we have them going in opposite directions. One to the left, one to the right, originating kind of at that same central node. We see that again represented here. We have world, which is kind of interesting. These are leaves that circle around the stem as a group. These are a world appearance. We see the world, the world, and the world here. So these are three different types of leaf arrangements and patterns that they have. Continuing on uh, with that parallel, palmately and pinnately, good three examples here. Um, we're going to parallel that palmately, kind of like the palm of your hand, and pinnately has that strong midrib. And these veins that we're seeing the different arrangements of are composed of both xylem and phloem. Now looking at shade leaves, may initially appear similar between these two, but are specialized for their own particular microenvironment. They tend to be larger, thinner, less me mesophyll layers, and fewer chloroplasts for the shade leaves. You can see here the leaves in direct sun have that much darker region, are able to ab absorb a lot more sun, so they pack in this top region. Our shade leaves are a little thinner, uh, they don't contain quite as many chloroplasts, they're simply not able or exposed to as much sunlight, therefore they don't build up the reserves like these ones in the sun. These ones in the sun, higher photosynthesis rate, better exchange with water, um, carbon dioxide and oxygen. That's why we see a little bit more complexity, a little thicker here in the um, ones exposed to sun. Our arid regions, uh, just to go back for one moment here, where it says it tends to be larger, that's not thicker, that's larger in area. That's kind of like wider when we say larger. Um, and we can see that in leaves that might be shaded. If you have a tree or a um, like a tomato plant too, the shaded leaves tend to be a little bit larger or wider in that case. Arid region leaves, they have many modifications to handle these environmental stresses. Uh, they have succulent water retaining leaves like this aloe. Thick leathery leaves if you ever touched an aloe plant. Fewer and or protected stomata. We see here is our stomata. They still have stomata, but they're recessed into the leaf a little bit more. They're not located right at the surface of the underside here. They're recessed a little bit more, protecting them, eliminating um, water from leaving as easily, creating a little bit more of an environment that can handle the, some of the more arid regions. Aquatic environment leaves. This is kind of an interesting note. The stomata will be present in higher numbers in the leaf's upper surface. So these lily pads. Because they're floating in water, if they had the stomata on the underside, they wouldn't be able to breathe. They have a higher percentage of stomata on the upper side of the leaves, as we see here, which is not characteristic of most of the other plants that we've seen for gas exchange. We want it to be protected. Well, in this case, on the underside is submerged in water, so therefore we dab them on the upper side so they can more efficiently exchange gases. Another specialized leaves here are called tendrils. If you looked closely at our pea plants, uh, they have these little tendrils that will grab onto the, the cages that we have. Uh, grapes are another example in squash plants. This helps support um, the stems as they grow. And these technically, while they look like little curly cues, they're technically modified leaves. Other um, leaves are insect trapping leaves. These are very specialized. Our pitcher plant, they look like little pitchers. Flies will fall in here um, and get trapped and then slowly get digested. These tend to be plants in all three of these cases where nitrogen is very low because they're basically breaking down the flies uh, as a nitrogen source. Sunnydews, they look like these little kind of little water droplets. Well, these are extremely sticky. And if a fly or a bug was to land on these, they'd be stuck here, and then the plant can consume them. And the obvious one, the Venus flytrap, when the fl fly flies in, it tingles these little fibers, and then these close up, and they will eventually consume the fly again to get some of the proteins and nitrogen from those flies. 
just some general ways uh, to help organize or identify certain plants. You don't have to be responsible for all of these different types, but when we do identification of certain leaves, these slides might be helpful. So you're welcome to pause them um, and try to compare what leaf sample you may have and how it relates. And we talked about a couple of these. A palmate leaf would be one example here. But you can see there's many different shapes and arrangements to leaves. Also, we talked about that margin being very important. Uh, and there are different types of margins that we can look at. And these are different classifications that we have to help identify certain leaves. And last we have the venation. We talked about some of the similar ones, the parallel, the palmately, the pinnately, but there's even more than that. So again, very important for identification purposes and kept on these nice large slides to help you um, be able to cross compare if you're trying to identify a sample leaf. Putting it all together, these are the, all the different types here. And again, I highlight each on its own individual slide.